On the morning of December 3rd, 1945, 20 miles or so out in the English Channel, Eric Brown found himself in a bit of a tricky spot. Of course, tricky spots were not a particularly uncommon situation for Eric Brown. He was, at the time, the most experienced test pilot in the world. But even so, this was a good one, and all of his own making. In about five minutes' time, against the advice of the ship's captain, he was going to attempt the first ever carrier landing by a jet aircraft and he was going to screw it up. The lead-up to that day in the channel had started some 18 months earlier. Eric Brown, better known as Winkle in the service, was busy at Farnborough when he ended up discussing jets with Morian Morgan, the head of the flight centre there. You know, Morgan said, you should be thinking of getting one of these onto carriers. Back in the day, this was how bosses gave test pilots their marching orders and we are surprised at their limited life expectancy. You might also be surprised that the Royal Navy had been so reticent in pursuing jet fighters to this point. In fact, they had generally underinvested in developing carrier aircraft throughout the war. Although the Seafire was a beautiful and iconic plane, in reality the Hellcat, and in particular the Corsair, were His Majesty's best fleet aircraft. With limited and overstretched resources, Britain had chosen to spend their money on land-based aviation and anti-submarine warfare. Most of the major fighting in the Western European theatre was in the easy range of land bases, so developing excellent carrier fighters was essentially pointless. They bought what the US developed for the Pacific and the European theatre. And yes, I am aware of the Sea Fury. Brown was apparently unfazed. Well, he replied, I can go over to the stables and see what we've got. I refer to my previous comments on life expectancy. In the stables were four early, some would say primitive, jet fighters. These were, in order of appearance, the one remaining Gloucester E-2839, a couple of early production versions of the Gloucester Meteor, a Bell Aero Comet borrowed from the US, and the second prototype of a new de Havilland light jet fighter called the Spider Crab. Although possessed of a rather higher tolerance for risk than your average person, Brown was not a fool. The E-2839 was little more than an engine testbed, and so was easily dismissed. The Meteor was too big and heavy to be a good candidate for carrier landings. As it happens, Brown had been the first man to land a de Havilland Mosquito on a carrier, so he knew a thing or two about putting a big twin-engined plane down on one. I should also mention that over the course of his career, he had made 2,407 carrier landings. I think that's a record that still stands today. Two down. Brown had also flown the Aerocomet quite extensively. He didn't care for it. The Bell aircraft was slow and it accelerated poorly. Its stability was also questionable. That left the Spider Crab. Eric Brown liked the Spider Crab. It was docile and easy to fly. The only real issue with it was the fundamental nature of jet engines. Whereas the approach speed of a piston engine fighter could be finally controlled using the throttle, jets responded more slowly to throttle inputs. Flying around that lag would be an interesting challenge. As it happened, the vampire assigned to Aeroflight, serial LZ551, had already been modified with the issues of deck landing in mind. 40% larger flaps and 8-inch wider air brakes had been fitted to increase drag. The idea was to lower the stalling speed and eliminate ground effect float caused by the vampire's low wing and short undercarriage legs. Brown returned to the project in May 1945. The Spider Crab was now the vampire, and he took the now partially navalized aircraft out on a couple of flights around the field. Finding much to like about it, he had further modifications made, including an upgrade to the latest Goblin 2 engine offering 3,000 pounds of thrust rather than 2,700 in the Goblin, and the fitment of the later teardrop-style canopy for better visibility. 
He also had the Pito tube moved onto the port wing to try and improve its function at high angles of attack and modifications made to the arrestor hook. The hook on the Vampire was a simple V-shaped arrangement that tucked up above the jet tailpipe. Test flights with it began in October of 1945, but after only a few flights the hook snapped off. It was strengthened and flights resumed. By late November, Brown had made numerous successful traps on a land-based mock-up of a carrier at Ford Aerodrome. He was ready to give it a go. In the background, rumours were swirling that the US Navy was about to make its own attempt at a carrier jet landing. Pressure started to mount. The designated day was December 3, 1945. When it dawned, though, the weather seemed pretty dicey. Visibility was quite poor, and there was a pretty significant chop in the channel. Brown took off anyway and headed for HMS Ocean, which was cruising out near the Isle of Wight. No sooner as he was airborne, the ocean's captain and an old friend of Brown's, Casper John, came on the radio and told him that the weather was too bad in the channel and they should abort. Brown overruled him. To get aboard successfully, the vampire needed to be light. He'd therefore taken off without much fuel, and it was touch and go whether he could make it back to Ford. Finding the carrier wasn't too hard. The sea condition was. It was rough. The ocean stern was moving through an arc of 24 feet and was also rolling 4 degrees. Needless to say, Brown went for it. The history books tell us that he made it. What they don't say is that he actually misjudged the heaving of the deck. Rather than catching an upswing and slamming the fighter down in the middle of the ocean's ten arresting wires, he put down as the deck dipped back, coming perilously close to being smashed to pieces on the stern rail and then snagging the first wire. In the film of the landing, you can see how much he stretches that wire out as it slows the vampire down. Still, any landing you survive is a good landing. Having done it once, he then repeated the trick three more times. Takeoffs, it turned out, were very much easier than landings. With plenty of power and an uninterrupted view forward, the vampire positively sprang into the air. From June 1946, they weren't exactly hurrying, several other test pilots checked out in the vampire aboard HMS Triumph without any issues. Their basic conclusion was that any experienced naval aviator would be able to consistently put it on deck. Their more nuanced conclusion was that the Vampire would never be a truly safe and effective carrier fighter because of the lack of responsiveness inherent in a centrifugal flow engine and the lack of fuel capacity. Although I can see the logic in this, the Vampire could carry drop tanks if range was truly an issue. It wasn't as if the Sea Fire and Sea Fury were known for their range, And, four years later, it would be these aircraft that went into action as fleet defenders in Korea. Despite its unsuitability for fleet operations, the Admiralty decided that it would be a good introduction to jet aviation and ordered 30 Sea Vampire F-20s, later reduced to 18. These started life as FB Mark V's built in the factory in Preston, Lancashire, and were shipped to Hatfield for modification. That means that they were the 1948 fighter bomber specification. They had the Goblin II and strengthened wings that were shortened by a foot. Armament was the usual four 20mm cannons with 150 rounds per gun and a couple of underwing pylons for stores. The modifications to make them F-20s were quite extensive. Obviously, they needed the arrestor hook to be properly fitted a long-stroke undercarriage more able to take the shock of carrier landing, and 31% larger air brakes and flaps were fitted. The landing gear was apparently the strongest then fitted to a production aircraft. In November 1948, the first of these aircraft performed a series of land-based catapult launches and arrested landings. Then they went on to do 60 landings on HMS Illustrious. A test squadron of six aircraft was formed and then deployed to HMS Implacable, then onto Theseus. On the latter, they tested out the Sea Vampire's ability to land on an unlit deck at night. 
once again it passed with flying colours. But that was it for the Sea Vampire. Despite its good performance, it was never mass-produced. Trainer versions supported new jet squadrons into the late 1950s. The Supermarine Attacker entered service in the middle of 1950, although it didn't ship out to Korea when that war started. The Hawker Seahawk and de Havilland Sea Venom also joined the fleet air arm in the early to middle 1950s. So why did the Sea Vampire never see service? After all, it was 90 miles an hour faster than a Sea Fury. Its ceiling was 8,000 feet higher and the types carried the same armament. On paper, it had slightly greater range. The jet aircraft was also smaller in footprint, although admittedly it didn't have folding wings. Vampire was being mass-produced at the time, so adding a hundred or so aircraft as an interim wouldn't have even cost too much. The Royal Navy seemed to dawdle with the development of the Sea Vampire. It flew in late 1945, but didn't enter service for over three years, despite being a relatively small modification to the land-based Vampire. If they'd hurried up, then rather than go into battle in Korea without a jet aircraft on a carrier deck, they could have had the Vampire. I can imagine there are several reasons. First, the UK was not very well off at this point in its history. The same strategic reality that impacted development of naval fighters from 1939 to 1945 played out once again. The RAF also needed modernisation and the Vampire was in high demand. The Soviet Navy was irrelevant in the European strategic balance, and, in any case, the Labour government at the time thought that they could achieve a friendly relationship with them. Secondly, the fleet air arm had dedicated aircraft in development. The Seahawk actually had even less range than Vampire, but it was 70 miles an hour faster and could carry heavier ordnance. Spending money on the Sea Vampire, which would inevitably have had a very limited service life, wasn't sensible, but using it as an introductory test bed made some sense. And that's the third reason. The MiG-15's performance advantage over the Vampire was so vast that it made little relative difference whether the fleet air arm were flying Sea Furies, which were reliable and available in large numbers, or new Sea Vampires. There just wasn't any point in buying an interim type. Still, I can't help but think it was a shame that we never saw the Sea Vampire in widespread service. De Havilland would have to wait for the Sea Venom until they got into the carrier-borne jet fighter game. Despite being the first to get started, the fleet air arm would have to wait into the 1950s for jets on the carrier decks. <laughs>